Kati certainly needs no introduction here in Budapest. Um, and I know there are many people here from the city and around the city who, who know her well and her extraordinary uh, work as a Hungarian-American in the United States, but with deep roots here in this city. It's a special privilege for me to introduce Kati um, for many reasons, including the fact that, Kati, you were the one who first introduced me to Hungary. And it happened in a very unlikely place. Um, and I'll explain. The unlikely place was in a military barracks in Dayton, Ohio. Now, how do I learn about Hungary in a military barracks in Dayton, Ohio, to say nothing of how do I meet Kati Martin there? Well, we were both there uh, 17 years ago uh, in a very important peace conference, the Dayton Peace Conference, and I was working with Kati's late husband, Richard Holbrook, who was the great architect of the Balkan peace process, and it was at that moment that peace was beginning to be possible in that region. And Hungary was playing a major role as a staging area for many of the activities and operations, uh, particularly by NATO, um, and also it was a destination for tens of thousands of refugees who were coming from the Balkans. And Kati and I talked a lot about Hungary because I was fascinated by this country from which she had uh, come and which she had deep roots in, having no idea that I would ultimately live there myself. Um, and I learned a great deal about her own deep commitment to human rights. Uh, and it was from Kati, and I think it was probably in that military barracks uh, that I first learned about the heroic efforts of Raoul Wallenberg, who, I had, who was a name that I had heard, but I hadn't known much in detail, and his uh, remarkable uh, heroism in 1944 in saving tens of thousands of Jews in this city um, from the terrible horrors of the Nazi death camps. And it was that year of the Dayton Peace Accords when Kati's own biography of, of Wallenberg, which we are celebrating here tonight in the Hungarian version, was first published. And Kati, your book became an inspiration for me in my work at the time, which was Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights. And needless to say, the inspiration of Raoul Wallen Wallenberg was extraordinary in hearing it from you especially. This year marks the centenary of Raoul Wallenberg's birth. And it also marks the year in which this university is launching a new center on conflict resolution and genocide prevention. And we will, the, we will name the center after Richard Holbrook, um, whose own heroic efforts as a diplomat saved countless lives from uh, in the former Yugoslavia uh, during the worst genocide in Europe since the Second World War. So there are many circles that are being uh, created here this evening. And I want to thank you, Kadi, especially for your leadership in helping us create the Holbrook Center, which will be a very fitting tribute to uh, Richard. And I cannot imagine a more inspiring way to capture the mission of our new center than, in fact, by celebrating the publishing of your book about Wallenberg. Um, and uh, let me just say a few points about Kati Martin's own biography before introducing our distinguished guest speaker in addition to Kati. Kati is a distinguished international journalist, an author, a human rights leader, an award-winning a uh, former ABC News correspondent and national public radio reporter. She's uh, the former head of the International Committee to Protect Journalists. As I said before, a trustee at CEU and a former trustee of a number of important human rights organizations, the International Rescue Committee, Human Rights Watch, Interna the International uh, Women's Health Coalition. She's received many awards for her human rights uh, work and her journalism and her writing. And she's the author of eight internationally acclaimed books, uh, one of which, of course, we're uh, here to uh, celebrate uh, tonight. So to help us in this celebration, 
Uh, we are very fortunate to have here with us uh, also the distinguished Swedish ambassador to Hungary, Karin Olaf's daughter, who is also a friend and whom I welcome uh, back to CEU. She's a frequent visitor here. Uh, ambassador Olaf's daughter is organizing a year-long series of events in Budapest uh, to commemorate the Wallenberg centenary, including one that we had recently, we held recently here uh, at CEU in February when we hosted Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt. Um, and before coming to Hungary last fall, Ambassador Olaf Stotter was Deputy Chief of Mission for Sweden in Washington. She has served as Chief of Staff to three Swedish foreign ministers. That's kind of a record, I would think. Uh, <laughs> And she chaired the uh, fearsome-sounding EU political military group during the Swedish EU presidency in 2001. She's, as I said, a frequent visitor to CEU and herself a passionate advocate of human rights. So I'd like to ask her to come to the podium for a few words before uh, uh, introducing and turning the evening over to our guest of honor and uh, speaker, Kati Martin. So, Ambassador Olaf Stotter. Thank you very much, and it's of course a great honor for me to speak before such a distinguished person as you, Kati, with your background here and, and everything you have done. So, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Budapest had one of its darkest times during the Second World War. We had the fascist regime uh, of the Arrow Cross, we had the Nazi occupation, and we had, of course, the atrocities against the Jewish Hungarians. And the story is by now fairly well known. It was during this low point in the history of Budapest that the 31-year-old old Swede, Raoul Wallenberg, arrived to Budapest with only one mission, and that was to save as many Jewish lives as possible. And the operation was set up uh, and financed to the government of the United States. We many times forget that. But it was carried out by the Swedish government. And we were neutral in the war, so that was what made this action possible from the Swedish government side. And Wallenberg came here on a Swedish diplomatic passport. And he chose to live a very comfortable life in Sweden uh, for Budapest, where the terror was raging. And he broke rules and he broke common praxis uh, to reach his goal. Uh, and I think, really do think, thanks to his personal abilities and his courage and dedication, Wallenberg saved thousands and thousands of life. And I would actually like to quote uh, President Obama from last week. Uh, I made the translation from Swedish to English, so excuse me if it's not entirely what he said, but he said something like this. He said that when the Jews of Budapest were marked with the yellow star, Raoul Wallenberg protected them behind the blue and yellow of the Swedish flag. When they were sent by train to the death camps, he pulled them out. And when they were sent on death marches, he followed them and he gave them food and he gave them water and gave them life. Unfortunately, it has taken uh, the official Sweden a very long time uh, to recognize the heroic deeds uh, of Wallenberg. And as I told you before, Sweden was neutral during the war. And our actions at the time were maybe not always heroic. They were very pragmatic and everything was done uh, to make Sweden stay out of the war. Thank you. It happened to me all the time, so don't worry about it. Well, Raoul Wallenberg, he did so much for others. and. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, the Swedish government hardly did anything to try to get him out of the Soviet Union when there was still time. And it really wasn't until the end of the Cold War uh, that Sweden started to get into terms uh, with our own role and our own history during the Second World War. So uh, in the 90s, uh, the Wallenberg family was given an official apology for the weak actions of the Swedish government when it comes to the fate of Raoul Wallenberg. And as you know, we have a duty never to forget and always uh, to remember. And we have to pass on the knowledge of what happened during the Holocaust to those who come after us. And that's in part why my government has decided to proclaim 2012 as the Raoul Wallenberg year uh, and to include a vast number of events in Sweden 
and beyond to help telling the story of Raoul Wallenberg and everyone else who helped in these actions uh, and all the things that he can remind us of. So as I said, I am deeply honored uh, to give these remarks at an event together with an excellent author and journalist as Cathy Martin. And you have done a tremendous job to keep the story and legacy of Wallenberg uh, present uh, and in our minds. And as I have understood, you published the book er already in the 80s, uh, the first time, uh, which was uh, a long time ago when I said my government wasn't really there. <laughs> so that, that was a very, very good thing. And I'm very happy that there is a new edition of your book now. And I, I truly do believe uh, that the uh, courage of Raoul Wallenberg must serve as an example to all of us uh, and for the generations to follow. And you know, today in Europe and all around the world, minorities are discriminated against. Uh, de democracy and freedom of speech is threatened. Uh, there is anti-Semitism, we have Islamophobia, and we have general xenophobia. And as long as this is going on, the deeds uh, and ideals of Raoul Wallenberg has not been fulfilled, and his work is not done. So that why is why your book is so important. We mustn't forget and we must learn. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. So without any further introduction, and for the moment we're all waiting for, let me uh, turn the podium over to Kati Martin, who will speak for about 25 minutes and then, ta and then take questions. We want to leave uh, time for questions from all of you. Please, Kati. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, John. Thank you, Karin, for those wonderful, generous words, both of you. It's a, it's a really deeply satisfying moment for me to be here in Budapest in, in the presence of, of the ambassador of Sweden and, and the representative of um, I, I, I like to think of John as not only the rector of Central European University, but, but one of America's great and distinguished diplomats. And, and of course, in the presence of so many Hungarian friends, thank you all. This is uh, a long time coming, this moment, and uh, 100 years after the birth of Raoul Wallenberg. But it's, but it's very timely. It's, his story is such a cautionary tale. And we have to, as, as the ambassador said, it's more than of academic interest that we, that we keep his story, Wallenberg's extraordinary uh, achievements here in this city uh, alive and that we tell our children about it. And uh, in, in some ways, it's our job to, to keep the story alive because, because the prior generation, my parents' generation, were in some ways too traumatized by what they experienced here on the streets of this beautiful city that suddenly turned murderous Hungarians turning on, on their fellow Hungarians and, and how quickly that hate can spread. I stood beside Richard during the Balkan Wars and I saw how, how quickly uh, neighbors can turn on neighbors and, uh, and how, how a, a, a skilled demagogue can light that fuse. And, and we, we really have to guard against that. And how do we guard the, against that? We guard against that by not just uh, putting Wallenberg on a bookshelf somewhere for history classes, but, but by talking about him and, and his extraordinary life and, uh, and telling our children what happened here. And I'm, I'm yes, uh, Karin, your government did not behave very well when Wallenberg needed the support of, of, his, of his countrymen, but, uh, but you have since really made up for that. And, uh, and so I have to say Washington didn't behave very well. There's shame enough here to go around. And of course, what happened uh, in Hungary is, is, uh, is the most painful chapter in, um, in my country, and it is the country of my birth's history. You know, when I um, started writing the story of Wallenberg, he was an unknown figure. And uh, of course now, 
he has emerged as one of a very small handful of heroes of history's bleakest chapter. And there are very few cities that don't have either a statue or a square or a street. Budapest has one of each. So does New York, named after Raoul Wallenberg. So that's, that is gratifying uh, to me. But, uh, but, as, but, I, but as I mentioned, our responsibility is no longer to erect statues to the man. But our responsibility is to ask some hard questions about and draw some lessons about how is it that this young man, he was 30 when he came here, inexperienced, not a diplomat, which by the way turned out to be an advantage because not being a diplomat meant, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, with, <laughs> you'll forgive me for saying this, uh, because he was un fettered by red tape and bureaucracy. And in fact, he broke every rule in the, in the diplomatic handbook. He did not check with the home office, with the foreign minister of the day, is this OK for me to save lives? The way American diplomats did at the time. Some of the cables that I've read from American consulates around Europe, there wasn't one in Budapest, are absolutely shameful saying that, that um, so-and-so is, is, is desperate, should we give him asylum? Uh, the answer came back, unfortunately, rescue was in the hands of, uh, of an anti-Semite named Breckenridge Long. Um, don't know if you're familiar with this, with this sorry chapter in the State Department's history, but he was a friend of uh, President Roosevelt and a Democrat from Missouri who was an out-and-out anti-Semite. And rather than loosen America's quota uh, on, on immigration during, during uh, this most, um, most uh, desperate time, he tightened it. And, um, and um, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of my great icons, uh, considered it her greatest failure and disappointment that she was unable to rouse her husband, the president, to the plight of European Jews. And when finally Roosevelt did bestir himself in the 11th hour to improve his, his, uh, his record of non-rescue and formed the War Refugee Board, which is the board that, that dispatched Wallenberg to Budapest, it was not through the State Department, but through the Department of Treasury which in those days was under Henry Morgenthau, a distinguished uh, member of, a, of a, a Jewish family, who went to the president and said, Mr. President, it is utterly shameful that, uh, that res the rescue of Jews has been placed in the hands of an anti-Semite. And here's what I propose. Uh, let's form this, this, this new organization, very small, unbureaucratic. Let's find someone willing to risk his life to go behind enemy lines to save the last Jewish community that's left to save, namely the Jews of Budapest. And that's how Wallenberg came into. Wallenberg signed up for this. He had no background. He, he had a degree in architecture from the University of Michigan. But he was a big-hearted young man who had seen something of the world's misery. He, uh, he was. He was born with, uh, his father died before he was born. He was born into one of the uh, most fabled and privileged families uh, in Sweden. The Wallenbergs continued to be a great financial uh, and industrial dynasty, but he was kind of a family black sheep because he was not interested in making money, a crime in that family. And, and therefore, that's part of the reason why they did not really uh, fight energetically <laughs> Uh, for, for his freedom once he was taken by the Russian forces. But I'm jumping ahead of myself, but I am assuming a certain knowledge on the part of most of you here as to what Wallenberg achieved here on the city streets, but perhaps you were not as familiar with, uh, with America's own belated effort at rescue. And by the way, when, when Roosevelt finally along with Churchill, decided it was time to bomb the rails to Auschwitz. It was his, his, his generals and Churchill's generals who vetoed that and said this would be a diversion from the war effort. Well, that's the problem in times of war, generals hold sway. Wallenberg's story, first of all, compels us to ask, what is it that motivates certain people to risk their lives? For others, well, it's a it's a fascinating uh, subject, and I feel 
quite confident, having studied Wallenberg's character, that in ordinary times he would not have even known this about himself. It sometimes takes an extraordinary moment that, that we discover really what we're made of. Not in good times. He was, he was not a remarkable person in any way until he reached this nightmarish city of Budapest which was bristling with, with, with the uniforms of the SS, the Hungarian gendarmes, and of course the makeshift uniform of the scariest bunch of them all, the Hungarian Arrow Cross, who, uh, who had basically free reign to do whatever they wanted in the, in the city of Budapest. But of course, I always saw this story as a race for life between Eichmann, the skilled killer, by now extremely well practiced in, in the business of liquidating entire communities, and this rather untested young man. When I first wrote this book, Karen, you said 30 years ago, it's true, it was, I was very young, I did not, I was the same age as Wallenberg, and I, it did not strike me then as extraordinary how young he was, because 30 didn't seem so young. Now it seems very young. And, and, uh, and now, you know, it's, it's, it's all the more astonishing what this man did, and all the more, I can't think of a, a, of a softer word than shameful, that entire nations held and conferences in very pleasant places, Bermuda, Evian, to discuss what to do with the so-called humanitarian crisis, and obfuscated, and stalled, and we've seen that since then too, haven't we? And why is it that the killers have more passion and more zeal for their job? than the humanitarians. Well, Wallenberg matched Eichmann for passion and for zeal. But meanwhile, with the obfuscation, with the stalling of the great powers, Hitler and the Nazis and their Hungarian allies, of course, gained confidence, gained, gained, uh, gained courage to, to proceed with their, their terrible business. The other reason why, the, why we have to keep talking about this today, even as we see what's going on in Syria, for example, is that genocide is never a spontaneous act. It takes, it takes time, it takes preparation, and the world really does have time to, to react. There is, it's a step-by-step -step process, and so it was with, with the Nazis. And it always starts with words. Words really matter. You know, uh, Richard um, used to chide me. He, he after, after all those years with those terrible war criminals in the Balkans, he, w he became even more sensitive to words. And if I so much as said that somebody looks a certain, you know, he looks like a Serb, do you think he is? He would say, what do you mean by that? You know it starts with that. He looks like such and such. And say, okay, okay, I, you know, you know what I mean. He has dark hair, whatever. And he said, don't do that. He, he'd get very upset. And you know what? He was right, because it does start with words. And then, of course, the words become enshrined in laws. And then the laws turn into action. And so long before the, the machinery of, of uh, long before the, the killing machines, the, the gas chambers were were, were turned on, there were signs on benches in this beautiful city, uh, Jews not allowed. So what was the world thinking while this was going on? That they were just fooling around with, with these signs? That anybody who read Mein Kampf, as, as Richard's grandfather did in his native Hamburg in 1933, could see that, that, <clears throat> that the elimination of Europe's Jews was not a sidebar to, to Hitler's ideology. It was at its heart. It was its core. And um, Richard's grandfather read it and packed up his family that week and moved them to Buenos Aires, which is why the whole book survived. But how many people, how many others did that? Too few. Some did, but certainly my grandparents and great-grandparents did not because this was the city that they 
had helped to create. They were part of the fabric of the city. Why should they leave? They had, they had served in, in uh, Franz Joseph's army, decorated. That's part, one of the things I discovered is that, is that one of the reasons why human beings are so slow to react, despite all these obvious signals, is that we, A, <coughs> we have a tremendous capacity for denying the obvious, and B, we, we can't imagine the unimaginable. We cannot wrap our minds around unimaginable things. And um, when, when the first reports about uh, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto uh, reached Washington via a, a, a Polish diplomat named Jan Karski who went to Judge Justice Felix Frankfurter, uh, great Supreme Court justice, um, Frankfurter said, it's not that I think you're lying, it's just that I cannot believe you. So there you are, this was a, a distinguished um, jurist of Jewish background himself who turned the diplomat away and said, this is inconceivable. So it was, um, it was very late in the day when uh, Raoul Wallenberg arrived uh, to this nightmarish city. It was too late for the German, for the Austrian, for the Dutch, and f uh, uh, the French, and the Polish Jews. But up, uh, the Hungarian Jewish community was, was Europe's third largest. And once Wallenberg arrived here, he sized up the situation, and, and this is when his remarkable personal powers really clicked in, and he de demonstrated that he was more than an ambitious young man, and, uh, and he was ambitious. He wanted to make his mark, but he was also uh, very um, entrepreneurial. He um, decided that, first of all, he had to uh, out uh, Teutonic, if I can put it that way, the Teutonics. He had to out-Nazi the Nazis, and so he could take on the, the personality of, uh, of a Germanic officer in confronting um, German officers and, and their Hungarian allies because they were impressed by authority. And he had also working for him the fact that, that, that any sane person knew the war was over this was the, the last six months of the war, and therefore the threat of war crimes trials. There was already talk of Nuremberg then, and he could use that, John, much the, much the way that, uh, that Richard and you uh, used the threat of war crimes against the Balkan criminals. That, that had a uh, certain sobering effect on, on the local Nazis, but he was, but he was also he was so clever, he, he, uh, he befriended the wife of the uh, uh, Hungarian uh, fascist foreign minister who was a, a rather attractive uh, Austrian baroness who um, th through, through her, Wallenberg was able to gain concessions from the Hungarian foreign ministry. In the end, her husband was executed as a, as a war criminal, but I found her living in Munich and we became friends. We still correspond from time to time. And, and she um, was an, an invaluable source for me in, in, in kind of trying to, to um, figure out, you know, what made this, this young Swede tick. And I'm so happy that I wrote this book when I did because such a book really needs uh, eyewitnesses to be credible. And uh, many of the people that I used as my sources ha are now either no longer with us or, or really uh, too old to, um, you know, memory, memory begins to fade. And, um, and of course, it's, it's documenting these, these eyewitness accounts that, that um, if I may say, uh, gives um, my book its strength. I didn't have to embellish. I didn't have to dramatize a thing. I could not have made up uh, the drama that, 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 that happened here. Um, so Wallenberg uh, was, was unafraid of all the usual undiplomatic uh, tactics like bribery and he always had money on him because he, he was a great student, as I have to say, Richard was of human nature. 
he could always figure out what worked with whom. With this one, a bottle of brandy. With that one, a woman. With the or a promise of one. With that, you know, people's people's. Uh, he was he was incredibly flexible. I think diplomats should read this book <laughs> because 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 uh, flexibility and humanity should be the two bywords of diplomacy, that ultimately diplomacy has to be about human beings. And if there is the possibility of saving a life, to hell with red tape, to hell with that's not how we usually do business here, which is how many times was Wallenberg told that, including by his own superiors. And I have to say, John, I'm deeply touched that that uh, uh, that you're 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 planning on on um, honoring Richard with uh, with such a such an uh, in such an appropriate way with an institute uh, for the prevention of of, uh, of genocide. Um, Richard was such a diplomat who always put human beings ahead of red tape. And it wasn't always popular with uh, officialdom. But, uh, but I think at the end of the day, that's how he succeeded. So I, I think it's, it's, um, it's wonderful that you're doing that. And I want to thank you for that. And um, I hope uh, Wallenberg is part of the curriculum. <laughs> um, so part of the, the, the other thing he did which no one had done for the Jews, was he gave them a sense of dignity and, and hope. You know, even, even when there was no hope, when, uh, though the trains were no longer running at the end of the war, but the, you know, the, the Arrow Cross were still determined to, to, uh, to quote, finish the job and, and started the, the horrendous death marches from, from, uh, from Budapest to the, to the German border. Wallenberg still didn't give up, and he drove along these bedraggled lines of, of humanity and, and um, refusing to acknowledge that it was hopeless. And at a minimum, he, he, he would thrust blankets, food, brandy uh, at, at people, and, and just uh, a human gesture on, on route to an inhuman end. And of course, he... he in fact, succeeded in bringing people back from that from the death marches by using his favorite stratagem, which was he would he would shout out in his best Germanic tone, uh, "Raise your hand if you have Swedish passports." And by now, it was understood that a laundry list would do. You know, whatever you could hold up, you know, any document would do. And then he would grab people out of the line, and 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 thus he was able to to save a few people. And he, of course, he was, he was uh, focused on young people because he, he, he wanted to, as he said, save a nation. Um, I think that, uh, that having, having successfully outmaneuvered uh, the Germans, whom everyone else said were, were beyond, um, beyond maneuver, uh, he did have a, a, a rather overweening sense of his own powers, and who can blame him? Um, he'd done miracles here. So that somehow, when the Russians came in, rather than do what his fellow diplomats did, which is to stay underground and wait for things to settle down in their, in their cellars, Wallenberg went to greet them. And he didn't know that this was not a liberating army, that it was an army of occupation with its own plans for, for, for Hungary. And those plans did not include saving the Jewish, the remnants of the Jewish community. Wallenberg had a plan, which he presented uh, to, the, um, to the officer in charge in Debrecen, where he met him. And of course, by then, the, uh, the Russians were, were seeing his, his uh, passports everywhere, these, these uh, Swedish passports with Wallenberg's name on them. Who is this Swede, and what is he trying to do here? And obviously, he's an American spy. Why would, it, why would anyone uh, risk their lives to save Jews? 
uh, as a humanitarian gesture. And so he became a, uh, a marked man at that point. And of course, um, those of you who, who experienced this, this nightmarish time know that the Russians were taking people who were far less suspicious than, than Wallenberg for a little malenka robot, a little work. Uh, because the Russians, unlike the Germans, they weren't looking for Lebensraum, they were looking for labor. They weren't looking for space, they were looking for hard labor to, to build uh, build their, rebuild their country. Wallenberg was taken and, um, and, and at that point his magic ran out and the world really uh, turned its back on the man. And uh, for, it took decades for people to, his own country, um, the United States and Hungary too, to, uh, to acknowledge his, his, uh, his achievements, and I really, because his end is so beyond sad that after, after all his, his humanitarian uh, good works here, that, that he would meet such a terrible end is almost beyond, uh, it's inconceivable. I prefer to focus on what he achieved and what it says about the very real presence of, of goodness in, in humanity. We are so aware of the presence of evil. And God knows this particular chapter is the most vivid illustration of man's capacity for inhumanity to his fellow man. And we also uh, saw it from close up not so many years ago in this neighborhood in Bosnia. But Wallenberg is a wonderful reminder of, of the other thing as well, and that's what I like to emphasize. And I think that, that that's really the best way for us to, to memorialize him, is, is to keep his example alive as a cautionary tale of the, the, the terrible danger of, of allowing um, Hatreds that start out small build into a forest fire which is uncontrollable and how it is, it is possible to stop genocide in its tracks but not, not easy once the killing has started. So those are the lessons that, that, uh, that I think we need to, to draw from this, from, from Wallenberg's wonderful story. And of course, it all happened right here in this city. For, for Hungarians, it's absolutely essential to, to be familiar with his story and with what brought him here and why was it necessary for a young Swede to risk his life to save Hungarians who were killing Hungarians. It's really important today for, for this, this cautionary tale to be familiar to every Hungarian and I, um, I hope they all buy my book, not only because I want my book to be a success, but, uh, but because I think it's, uh, it's extremely relevant in the times that we're living in. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and, If you, have, if anybody has any questions, comments, uh, yes. Yes. And how did the family? Yes. How did they react to the? Oh. Okay. Well, uh, my. Okay, my. How <laughs> yeah. how I came to this story. Yeah. Well, and, how, and how the family reacted as well. Right. Right. Um, well, in fact, this this uh, this uh, work changed my life in two ways. One, um, it was the first book I wrote, and I decided in writing this that I I was I was in a news uh, correspondent that I wanted to become a full time writer because I loved the process of research and didn't even mind the loneliness of writing. And um, that was seven books ago. 
and also in the course of interviewing someone who Wallenberg had saved, I, dis I, I was led to my own history. In a very matter-of-fact way, uh, a lady, um, a Wallenberg uh, rescuee said, well, unfortunately, uh, Raoul arrived too late for your grandparents. And that was news to me. Uh, I had been told that my, that my grandparents had died during the siege. So many had. It was entirely plausible. When, in fact, uh, they were in one of the early transports to Auschwitz from Mischkoltz. And uh, my parents, when I said earlier that our parents' generation were too traumatized to talk about this, I was really thinking about my parents. Because uh, whenever I would ask my mother um, about her parents, my grandparents, I've never, to this day, I've never seen a picture of them. Because everything was taken from their house, nothing left. And uh, my mother could not bring herself to talk about it. I, I, no question she felt some guilt that she survived her parents and she could not save her parents. And I, ha I was rather harsh in my judgments of them because how could they withhold such an essential fact? I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Um, I had until then really not a clue. I was you know, lucky enough I, I, uh, to uh, come of age in America. Um, I um, was, very, was very pleased to know my roots. I, it made perfect sense. I uh, have shared everything with my children. I think it's an enormous mistake to keep secrets from one's children. And it created a rift between my parents and me, which, which I'm happy to say that since we had the world's greatest negotiator in the family, uh, the rift healed. And Richard actually played a big role in that because uh, he totally understood them. I was much more judgmental. He said, look at Kati, you wouldn't be here if your parents wouldn't have been who they were. They, uh, they were survivors and, um, and tough. And, uh, and so shut up and understand them. <laughs> yes. Oh. Um, very, very interesting because uh, I read the book a long time ago. Um, but what you said, there are a few things here that were new to me. But um, I, I rather mention things that uh, uh, I don't entirely agree with. Uh, you mentioned. That's very Hungarian. Yeah. <laughs> Say something so I can contradict you. Yes. Um, the, it's it's the, the bombing of the railroads. Yes. Aligns to, to Auschwitz. Yes. Uh, I looked into it, but m mostly from personal experience. Yes. You cannot bomb railroads. Uh, if you hit them mm -hmm. accidentally, really, because it's yeah. very hard. Uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, they repair it. Uh, the only possibility is to bomb successfully a railroad bridge because that they cannot restore immediately. I, I, I will not argue with that. I will tell you, however, that, um, that, that the testimony of Auschwitz inmates, survivors, including uh, Gertes Imre and Ali Wiesel, uh, say that they would have drawn such uh, encouragement had a few bombs been dropped from the sky, even if they didn't absolutely uh, obliterate the lines, just a signal that the world gave a damn. Really, more as a sim symbolic thing. But I, well, I, I take your point that technically well, it was challenging, but sometimes symbolic acts are as important as, as uh, concrete. I, I, but, I but there, if, there are other, if there are other questions, I'd love to continue this, this yeah. discussion no, about the rails. I just want to say that, that I believe in symbolic acts. Okay. But to get to Auschwitz yes. uh, by been. airplanes of the yeah. time, um, well, yeah, it needed more than a symbolic act. Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm still not convinced, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I take your point. <laughs> Uh, yes. What about Wallenberg's family? Um, did they do very much to pressure the Swedish no. government? No. The answer is no. His mother died. If it's possible to die of heartbreak, his mother died of heartbreak. And it was at that point that, that Wallenberg's sister 
uh, decided to go public with Wallenberg because, because the mother believed in, in quiet diplomacy and uh, back channels and, um, and, and the daughter, who by the way is uh, Kofi Annan's mother-in-law, so I first met the Secretary General when I was researching Wallenberg 30 years ago. Um, I, I actually introduced Richard to Kofi Annan. <laughs> um, so the, the, um, the, the, the family, uh, the, let's say the big Wallenbergs, the bankers, the financiers, they uh, were not really deeply interested in, and, and the mother was pretty much on her own. And of course, her, uh, Wallenberg's father had died be, uh, before he was born, so he was, he was left vulnerable anyway. Um, but it's, it's not, a, not, a, not, a, not a great show of courage on the part of this great family. Yes, sir. You said um, some very important things in terms of what's relevant today. Yes. That words matter. Yes. Um, the word cosmopolitan, which has been banti bantied around here in recent years yes. and months. Um, and you also said, how come the demagogues have more passion than peacemakers? <laughs> uh, and then what motivates one for l risking one's life? And everything seems to come in a circle for me, because just like you, uh, I was born here. Yeah. I was raised as a Catholic. My mother never admitted her Judaism until she died, even though yeah. by that time I knew. <laughs> but, and so I understand that, that whole concept of staying quiet. What is frightening and what we cannot allow happen is that these words that matter result in... Actions. T, no, yeah. in negative actions, such as the TEK, this new secret police, and various other things in Hungary that are a reality right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we need passion to, to make sure that history does, doesn't repeat itself here. Agreed. <laughs> Words do matter. Yes, Peter. Thanks so much for the wonderful talk. And I wish all, I wish all Hungarians heard it. And, and <laughs> I, I wonder whether you agree that the best, uh, best response to such hateful words, the danger of which you uh, highlighted, is, uh, educa are ed ed is educational effort like this book. And also that I would like to ask that are there some special plans to distrib distribute the book and perhaps to turn it to this edition to a movie to reach <laughs> as many Hungarians as possible? Yeah. Well, I, 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 I want to acknowledge uh, the presence of my publisher, Kuno Laszlo. Can you, can you stand and, and um, I, I am so uh, happy. I am so happy to be published by this distinguished publisher and and Corvin Books, which is which is a, a wonderful house, and and uh, they have seen fit to translate and publish my my works. And uh, let's see, I hope that uh, that that you will uh, distribute the book widely. So, thank you for asking that question, <laughs> um, and and they will. Yes. It's not that I, I'm happy to talk about it. What I said was um, that I think it's really important to focus on what he achieved. I am, if we have another hour here, yeah. uh, we can talk about his trip through the gulag. But unfortunately, journeys through the gulag have a rather uniform quality. His was no different. And, um, and to you know, get, get bogged down, and here's another thing. Um, a, a certain mythology now shrouds Wallenberg. He's, al he's almost a Wagnerian figure, you know, who descended from the skies, did his miracles, and then disappeared. And um, it's very easy. In the, early, in the early stages of my research, I discovered that, uh, you know, people wanted, wanted him to be alive through the f uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, that the... 
Um, but in fact, it's more, it's more um, in the way of mythology and also wishful thinking. I frankly wouldn't wish a long life in the gulag on anybody. So it's not that I'm, I hesitate to, to talk about it. It's just, it's just that it, I don't find that it's productive. Um, so just one very short question, and that is that um, um, there have been other people taken to the gulag from Hungary. So for instance, uh, hundreds of thousands. The prime minister yeah. was taken, and lots of other people. And uh, the, the impression that I have about uh, their afterlife is that it's easier, it's more accessible to get a straight record of what happened to people like Betlan or other uh, yeah. Hungarian um, uh, 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 prisoners yes. than it is uh, to get a record of Wallaberg. And I really am yes. puzzled. I don't understand yeah. it. There's Can I no tell you why? Sure. Oh, okay, okay. The, the uh, Swedish ambassador would like to take that question. Yes, no, I just come, come to the mic. Yeah. I just briefly want to explain what my government has tried to do. So after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, we installed a commission uh, together with the Russians trying to, to find out what happened to him. Uh, we got quite far, but not far enough. We have a paper that the Russians say is the paper that uh, he died in 1947. We don't know if that is true. Uh, we made another, um, how do you say, Document, a document within our ministry to, to go through our own actions, and it's called a, a diplomatic failure from 2003. And the government has just decided to send uh, the person who was responsible for that uh, research back to Moscow this year to see if we can put uh, questions to the Russians in another way. Can we then get to other parts of their archives? We don't have very big hopes for this, but we will make one more attempt. Thank you. Are there, yes, sir, in the, in the back. Just stand up and shout it out, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in your excellent uh, Thank you. you. a lot of people that Wallenberg uh, worked with or met here in Budapest, but you don't mention uh, once uh, the Swiss diplomat Karl Lutz, and I wonder if there is a reason for that, that you exclude him from the book. You know, there, you're, you're quite right. There were other uh, humanitarian uh, efforts here in, in Budapest. And in fact, um, Karl Lutz was, was, uh, was also heroic. Um, and uh, even there, 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 were, there were others, a Portuguese, uh, somebody from the Vatican. But uh, my book is about Wallenberg. Any other questions? Well, I'm, I'd be delighted to uh, dedicate um, books and, and have you spread them far and wide <laughs> across the map of Hungary and encourage your children to read it too. But above all, thank you for being here this afternoon. Thank you.